This is Tuned Into the Land, the California Rangeland Trust podcast. Here, we will dig into a variety of topics with the partners, conservationists, and ranchers who demonstrate every day, through their words and actions, the importance of conserving California's working lands. Tune in each month to learn more about our mission and how you can get involved in preserving the future of the Golden State for generations to come. Hello and welcome to another episode of Tuned In to the Land, the California Rangeland Trust podcast. I am Michael Delbar, the CEO of the Rangeland Trust. Today we are joined by a very special guest and friend, Dr. Dave Daly. Dave is a fifth generation cattle rancher in Butte County. He's the past president of the California Cattlemen's Association. He has spent more than 30 years with the College of Agriculture at California State University, Chico. Excellent school, by the way. Served as the associate dean of the College of Agriculture at Chico and was animal science professor at the university for many years. And he is the current farm administrator for the Paul Byrne University Farm. In September of 2020, the North Complex fire ravaged the Plumas National Forest. The area was and still is home to a grazing lease held by Dave and his family. And during that fire, over 319,000 acres burned. And for Dave, he lost almost a whole herd of cattle. Since the fire, Dave and cattlemen across the state have worked hard to turn a true disaster into an opportunity to affect real change. So with that, we welcome Dr. Dave Daly to the podcast. Good morning, Dave. Good morning. How are you today? We're doing great. Good, a little Dave. bit of rain, so you know, can't complain the least bit about that. Yeah. So Dave, why don't you tell the listeners a little bit more about yourself, your family, and your multi-generational involvement in the cattle industry? Sure. Um, we're from Butte County, California. I actually ranch. Hometown is Oroville which is kind of nestled up against the foothills of Sierra Nevada. My family came there in about 1850 as Irish immigrants, miners. They passed all the beautiful land in the valley and all the where all the wealthy rice and tree farmers lived. And uh, we went up in the hills and tried to scratch a living from there. And then it evolved. At that time, people did everything because they had to raise their own food. And you know, so they timber and cattle and just a little bit of whatever you needed to do to make a living. And it gradually, particularly my dad, but my grandfather started building the cattle business. So we're pretty much a cattle operation at this point. Um, I'd be the fifth generation in the business. And then um, my son and two sons and daughter are both directly or indirectly involved. My oldest son's full time. And then uh, I've got grandkids. So (laughs) we're still doing this. We've been there. I don't plan on going anywhere. And so I've always been involved. I, I had another life as a professor, but I've always been involved in the ranching business. I think of myself as a cattleman first. You've taken that experience and turned it into a presidency for the California Cattlemen's Association and a current board member of the California Cattle Council. So can you tell us a little bit more about your leadership and volunteer work in the cattle industry? Yeah, I think it evolved. One, I was always a strong believer that we're doing the right thing on the land, that the cattle business uh, really cares about doing the right thing. And we want to be um, sustainable long-term. And so that was part of it. And then frankly, the other part of my life was the university um, as a professor. And so I had a lot of opportunity to interact with people across the country. And I saw value in what the California cattlemen specifically were doing as well as national cattlemen. And so it wasn't a planned thing to move up and become president of California cattlemen. It was just a gradual evolution. You work at the county level, like many of our volunteers do. Eventually you're going to meetings at the state level and then the national level. And it it just, um, once you realize how important it is to give back, I think it's part of what we do. I'm currently uh, chair of federal lands for the National Cattlemen's Association as well. So I spend quite a bit of time or did pre COVID now it's zoom, but quite a bit of time in DC and in Denver, uh, trying to work on federal issues for the cattle business, as well as my service with California cattle. And you're intimately involved in the, on the public land side because you run cattle in the Plumas National Forest. You've held that lease for quite a long time. How growing up out there and seeing the changes over time and the changing regulations, how is that, in your view, how has that changed between the time when you were a kid and what you see now? Sure. So we actually were taking cattle to Plumas National Forest before there was a forest service. Um, it started in the 1800s and we were moving cattle to uh, we everybody. It wasn't just us, all the small ranchers. 
we had private land in the foothills in the valley. And then in the summer, we moved to the high country. And that was just part of it. My grandfather, great grandfather were doing that. Um, and then about 1917, I think we were issued our first permit, which in my world was kind of recent, right? Um, you know, we've only, that's only been a hundred years and the permits are, people like to blame California for issues, but those are all federally regulated. They are not state and they are, we're called an allotment. We're on the Fall River allotment, which is um, east of Lake Orville up in the high country. And so it's big timber country, lots of water. And we started taking our cattle there. So federal lands issues became pretty important to me. That means I have to deal with the Forest Service. Uh, again, it's not with Sacramento. It's not with regulators in, in California because the federal government sets the mandates. So that's why we got involved pretty heavily with how that impacts. How it's changed over time. I think the biggest thing we've seen is just obviously there is more regulation, but I don't think the regulations are onerous. It's the fact that you don't own the land. So there's a lot of things you can't do. Mm -hmm. And we've seen this horrible, it, uh, we just have ignored what's happened to fuel loads. And I've seen the change. My dad and my mom remember, but she's 92. She remembers when much of that country was open with big timber. Now it's all choked with brush because we couldn't do what was the right thing to do um, starting really since Smokey the Bear time, if not before. And we see the, the messages, log it, graze it, or watch it burn. And, and that has unfortunately rung so true. You know, to all of us that, that are running on particularly public lands, the that misconception that if we leave the land alone, it'll be pristine and, and wonderful. Yet we know that failure to manage is the worst management tool we've got. Yeah, and I agree with you 100 percent. My, my problem with uh, the term log it, graze it or watch it burn is it it doesn't resonate with people outside of our community. Mm -hmm. It sounds like we want to. Uh, take over and basically rape the land for our own benefit. And so I appreciate the sentiment. I think the language hasn't helped. I think the language needs to be more uh, inclusive of the public in terms of what we do. So it's really about rather than say log it, graze it or watch it burn, we say about look at your insurance rates and how we may lose your homes and how do we manage that differently? Does that include lots of different tools? One of them might, might be thinning. We might say it's logging, but thinning is an appeal. Mm -hmm. And I think our wordsmithing in agriculture tends to appeal to insiders. And we do a very poor job of recognizing how critical it is to, to communicate with people that don't think like us. And very honestly, don't get me on a soapbox, but I think a lot of us on social media in agriculture do a horrible job. We're so attack prone to people who don't think like us that why would they listen to us? You know, I think we tend to be insulting. It's like, you know, we live here, you live there, you're stupid. And anybody who posts that stuff, I think does agriculture a disservice. I think it could be reframed in a positive manner to say, we're in this together. We're all Californians. We have different issues, but very frankly, these forests belong to all of us. When you destroy the ecosystem, you destroy the water system. So we need to get people to not think about what happens to us. We need them to be more realistic that we care about what happens to them as well. And it's one of our failures in agriculture. And I don't see it getting better. So let's take that a little bit further. In 2020, we had the Bear Fire in September. That was just so devastating, not only to the timber and the grasslands, the whole ecosystem of the forest, but to the communities, your and your family's lives. Uh, it's just, it was heart wrenching. Yet you took the time to keep a journal and you took those notes and you shared that on social media. You told me at the time that you would do whatever it takes to get that message across to policymakers. And I think your account really helped change some hearts and minds. Tell us a little bit about what drove you to take that message and put it out on social media. I'm not a social media guy. Everybody knows that. In fact, I didn't even post it the first time I made my daughter do it um, because I get frustrated with social media. But I think, frankly, me writing that down was... Well, maybe it was cheaper than therapy. How's that? Um, I thought it was important to chronicle the account, uh, both for my kids and grandkids, but also for people to recognize the scope of the issue. And I, I, I worked really hard, not necessarily in the writing, but it was a true thought process of it's not going to do good to blame one group. 
all of us need to accept responsibility for what happened. I was, I think I said, I'm mad at everybody. I'm angry at everybody, but it's everyone's fault and it's no one's fault. When we start saying, well, it was the Forest Service or it was the environmentalist or it was the ecos or it was the regulations. What you've done is you've alienated a large group of people before you've had a chance to engage them in the dialogue. I think it's really critical that we learn from that. And I, I think I did. I learned from that. I would say 20 or 30 years ago, I was a much more um, confrontational. I still am, but I've learned to mute that so people will listen to me and try and respect that they don't see it the same way. So that went viral and um, I didn't expect it to. I think there were like 30,000 shares or some damn thing. I have no idea. It was picked up. I got I got feedback from Germany, from Canada, from Australia, uh, from Latin America, from all over the world on those comments. And even the one I put yesterday, I saw people in Australia saying same issues here, right? We have the exact same issues and they're in, uh, they're in Victoria. And so it was a chance to bring the discussion to the fore. And so I thought it was important to do so. It was picked up then by, frankly, a local paper, a Chico Enterprise record, and they did the whole thing. And then it was, and this, kind of, I got, <laughs> somebody called me and paid me to put it in Reader's Digest. I didn't write it to put it in Reader's Digest. And then it became, which I thought was kind of surprising, um, something I didn't even know existed. It's called Best Long Reads of 2020. And that's kind of an exclusive list for authors. And I was in the top 10 of that group. And I was like, really? Wow. I'm not an author. I'm not a writer. I'm a scientist. But I think the message from there is if we tell our stories in a way that are not attack based, um, they're more, um, how do we understand the issue? I think people resonate with that. And the other piece, which was hard for me as a trained animal scientist is people are more fascinated with the emotion than the fact. Well, with the fires that, we've experienced in this state, I think more and more people are getting exposed to those. Even if they may not be right in them, they're close to those. I mean, right now we've got the Mosquito Fire in Placer County, which is 76,000 acres. The Fairview down in Riverside, which is another 28,000 acres. And then of course the Mountain and Fire in Siskiyou, which is 14,000 acres. So up and down the state, more folks are being exposed to these fires. They're living with the smoke that's lingering in the air for weeks after some of these large fires. I don't think it's, I don't think that's going to change. And I do think there's a lot of issues we would like to argue about with the general public. Uh, I think fire and drought are two issues that impact everyone. And so I think it's an opportunity for us to be the good guys, you know, to point out the issues and say, here's some solutions. And all of a sudden grazing is cool again, particularly for sheep and goats, which is a little irritating. But <laughs> um, I think if we can transition that to livestock in general, I think people are saying, wait a second. That's something we'd never thought of. Yes. However, unfortunately, I was on a meeting. I was in a meeting last year and there were representatives of environmental organizations in California. And California Cattlemen's was running a bill to, to enhance grazing on state lands. And <laughs> those representatives of environmental organizations kind of laughed at that and said, we're going to kill that. <laughs> so it makes one wonder, are they really getting the message that grazing is a valuable tool for wildfire fuel suppression, or are they stuck in those old ways of cows are bad, we can't have grazing on these lands. And these fires provide a great photo op. And you get politicians coming from all over, all different shades to get to be out there and, and want to do something. Since that fire occurred in 20, you have been a strong advocate for some change, taking that opportunity, the devastation of that fire and creating an opportunity to really affect some change. What has been the success since then legislatively? Because the state and the feds have created a policy shift that can't easily be turned, but you got to start doing it. Yeah. What has happened? What's it's happened? slow and it's frustrating because to us, some things would be obvious. I would expect environmental groups, extreme environmental groups to continue to resist. And that's why this needs to go to the public. And I think each time you take it, it gets a little closer, a little farther. We've had some good things happen um, based on my experiences loosely. We ended up with this uh, livestock pass to get into catastrophic wildfires. It was signed by Governor Newsom recently. We saw um, limited liability for prescribed fire pack practitioners. So you can start and both of those were signed by the governor this year. So I think we're making progress. I had the opportunity to have 
uh, Secretary of Agriculture, Secretary of Natural Resources, Deputy Secretary for Climate, Deputy Secretary for Forests, as well as the head of the United States Forest Service come to my ranch. We went up and saw it firsthand. That's the real change. When they see it firsthand, I think then people start to pay attention. So I'm not naive enough to think it'll change overnight. It's frustrating because it's obvious. And I just wrote another piece frustrated with our unwillingness to recognize the issues. But I think more and more people are saying that. And I, I don't care who says it. I don't need any credit. We just need to have that discussion. And, and I think as you start to get pressure from communities, um, I think that we're going to be, we're going to see a, I would say we're seeing a, a general change now will probably take, unfortunately, 10 years to see the real impacts. And I think the, I'll call them the less extreme environmental groups. I'm an environmentalist. I'm proud of that. I think the less extreme groups get it already. Mm -hmm. But just like us are careful with funding and coalitions and relationships. And so even the people who understand it, it's like, we get it, but we can't sign on. You know, it's kind of the behind the scenes part. And that frustrates me in politics, but you know how that game is played. Yeah. And neutral position could be the best we can get sometimes, but it's that opposition position that is tough because it makes one wonder, didn't you see this? Yeah. Didn't you, didn't you feel those impacts? Don't you want to find a solution to that? So what attempts at, at change were tried that didn't succeed lately? And what can we do to do better on that front? I think your example of grazing on state lands that's, that's one that's going to be tough for people. Uh, one, there's really not a lot of infrastructure left. We've dismantled all the fences mm-hmm. and the water systems. So it, I think that's going to take probably five to 10 years for people to say, wait, that makes sense. Um, there was some good work that the Cattle Council funded out of University of California Extension, uh, Debbie Rao, um, who's an extension person from, I believe, Monterey County. I may have the county wrong. But she modeled how much fuel load is, how much fuel is being taken out of the system by cattle grazing. And how, and I, I can't remember the number, but it's like 11.6 billion pounds. And how ungrazed versus grazed really reduced flame length. You can keep the flames under four feet. Um, then you have a chance. It doesn't really do that much damage. It clears. Um, and it takes grazing to do that. That data is just getting ready to be published. And I think when you start getting that information, it unfortunately takes a long time to get in the public consciousness. And we're never going to change extremists. And I think one of the mistakes we make in the cattle business and in agriculture in general is thinking we're going to influence the 5% on either side. And we have them in our business too. Right. And so I don't care if it's far right or far left. We tend to respond to that stuff, realizing that the general public isn't like that. The general public just wants good information and they're in the middle. And if you're in a place like my County, the, the campfire where it destroyed the town of paradise two years before it destroyed our range. And there were a hundred people killed. They listen. Right. And, and I think those models are being shown across the country. My challenge is I think we're going to get further ahead with this in California than we are federally because the federal government owns half of California. But they're so big and so one size fits all that they don't listen. And I don't care if that's a Trump administration or the Biden administration. We tend to think, oh, well, if it's our side, they're going to fix it. No, they aren't. The bureaucracy is too big. Mm -hmm. And I think trying to get that back to local input is really important. So we aren't going to have successes on all of these. We're going to continue to have failures, but you keep rolling along. And if you model good things and do them well, I think then eventually it becomes accepted and mainstream. With the budget surplus in California, this could be the time to reinstate that infrastructure on those public lands, those state lands, the fences, the water systems. Because there was the time where the mentality was, oh, cows have been on here, but we got to take them off to save the land. And we're starting to see, well, a lot of us always knew it, but others are starting to see that, well, that was a mistake. Yep. So now's the time to, to rectify that. One of my frustrations is there is a huge budget surplus in California. I, uh, I just wrote that new piece, but I think post-fire management has been abysmal. You know, I think we do a horrible job with pre-fire and post-fire. We fight them and spend a lot of resources. We do nothing to reduce fuel loads ahead of time. And then once they're burned, like ours, it's completely ignored. And so then brush sprouts up in the center. And essentially what you've done, if you've got all the dead oaks and pines and everything else, and now brush, we're setting it up again for fair. Absolutely. And I would really like to see those resources go towards how do we mitigate post-fire and make those natural fuel bricks? 
They burnt one time. So now you don't have a fuel load. So now you go in and knock the dead stuff down. We've got the resources to do it. Let support private landowners who want to create natural fuel breaks, whether it's cost share, whether it's matching, whether you let um, underrepresented people start a new business with a masticator and fuel load reductions. You know, there's ways that the state could support those of us who've gone through catastrophic fire or reduce it before it happens. They still listen. Uh, it's devastating to look out there after a fire. And we had the, in 2018, we had the ranch fire, the Mendocino right. complex. I remember it. Took out you know, one of our places and we grazed in the Mendocino forest and we lost cattle as well. Not anywhere near the scope of what you went through, but we went through it as well on our end. And even today, to see the dead trees, you can't drive out there without a chainsaw in your truck. You yeah. just can't do it. There's still trees falling and they're laying there. There was a timber permit, but you know, the Forest Service will get sued by folks saying, no, you can't take those trees out. They're dead. Yeah. They only have value for so long before they're just they're worthless. Yeah. But all that does is fall. And like you said, the brush builds up and we're just creating another fire hazard that's going to hit us again in a few years. And it's the worst on the federal land. So I'm in the Plumas National Forest, but I also have checkerboard land with Sierra Pacific, a timber company. They've logged all theirs already, almost, and replanted. I think their, I think their goal was three million trees a year for the next three years. And they, there's, they've got little pine trees and fir trees all over the country. And it's hard to look at because they took, but you get to the government piece, standing dead timber waiting to fall. And now it has no value. So when they do release a timber sale, they're going to pile it and burn it. There's no place to take. All the mills are full and they waited too long. Mm -hmm. So it it's a comedy of errors. And again, when I watch the people on social media, they want to say it's a California issue. No, this is a federal issue right. on the national forest. It's not, it's not just us. And I'm going to continue to push federally to say we've got to have change on the national forest. Now you, and you earlier on you made the statement, and it's absolutely true. There's enough blame to go around on all of this. Yeah, well, and that the Forest Service will get too. I, I, I do deal quite a bit with the National Agencies Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management, and I've been on a few listening sessions or I've testified to Congress on some of these issues. And it really is interesting or provided comments. I'll provide my comments. Somebody will come on afterwards and provide the exact opposite, you know, and then positive, negative. And we are so polarized with our views that I kind of understand the agencies feel paralyzed. They take all this public comment. It's 50-50. It's like, so now what? basically they piss everybody off is what it really amounts to. But hopefully our voice is going to start to resonate, but it can't be us. It's got to be the communities. It's got to be bigger than us. So how do we get there? I think we're starting. I mean, I, again, I tend, um, I tend to be a bit of a Pollyanna. I try, if I can look at the bright side, other people should. Um, I think that we're starting to shift the narrative. I wish it was quicker. I don't think it's getting nearly the traction it should, but I don't hear nearly as much anti-grazing stuff as I used to and less anti um, and more of a recognition that we have to do something with fuel load. You know, they may not be a fan of grazing. They may not be a fan of logging, but they know they're going to do something. They're going to lose their homes mm -hmm. or their water supply. And so um, I hate to use tragedy to, to move the agenda, but unfortunately it seems it takes it. Right. And we've had it all over the state now. What can the general public do to support these efforts? You know, that's that's a difficult question. I, I think I think the more they first of all, we we need to create a baseline understanding that we aren't just in this to graze our cows and make money. We're in this because we're committed to the landscape and we need them to be allies in that. I think the more they can then communicate, whether it's it might be board of supervisors, it might be city council, it might be locally, but I think good things that happen have to start at the local level. You know, I think they have to say, we see the value in this change. And if we can get them to think about that as a positive, and honestly, it's a little bit easier than it was because they're losing their insurance, right? When people lose their insurance, because then all of a sudden it's like, oh, do we have an alternative? Well, we're open to the discussion. So I think anything they can do, whether it's through California Rangeland Trust with California Cattlemen, we're looking to build a coalition that's broader than just cattle ranchers. And I think we can, but we need that engagement and we need them to talk to people and say, wait a second, you said we aren't for grazing. Well, what do you want to do? You want us to burn? You know, we change the dynamic. Um, unfortunately, you know, Oakland Hills, which you remember, is, was that 15, 20 years ago? 
um, that can happen again. Yep. I flew over there the other day. And when it gets to these communities, all of a sudden the world changes. We don't need it to be a tragedy for people to change your opinion of things. So I'm really hoping that we engage the public in a positive manner, build coalitions. All of us can do it. And it could be simply a neighborhood watch meeting, a fire group. And I think the public's willing to engage. This has been a great conversation about what we've been facing and what we've done to help address it. But any final thoughts on this? This is a huge issue. And like you said, it's not going to get much better very fast. So any anything that we've missed, any final thoughts that you can share? Well, I'll, I'll be honest. It's still, and I try not to let it be, but it's still a very personal and emotional issue for me. It's two years since we lost our coward and I have to go back there. Right. And my kids want to go back, but I have to take my 92 year old mom back. You know, it's hard. Um, it has been a difficult scenario, but I think the best thing we could do is learn to communicate the issues without being offensive and critical of others who don't understand. I think the assumption is, is that everybody's against us. And I, I get it. We feel like we're being picked on. And I think in general, most people just don't understand. I did an a interview with a local newscaster the other day and, you know, he was raised in L.A., right? And then you see said back to, he was, went to USC for his master's and he's in Reading and Chico. Well, how would he have context? So my job is not to say, you don't know what you're talking about. It's to, how do we build, I, I think we don't do a good job of building alliances with people who don't think like us because we don't understand it. And very honestly, had I not been at the university, I would be exactly the same way. But I learned at the university that you've got to figure out how to communicate with people who don't think like you. And I think we could do a much better job than we do. Um, I had a professor at Colorado State years ago. I was in graduate school. He said, Dave, quit hunting for gnats with an elephant gun. And it's always stuck with me because I used to fight over lots of things. And now I try and choose my battle. I don't think it's I don't think it's lessen my commitment, but I think it's like, don't offend people before you understand the issue. And honestly, on fire, I think we have the best shot we have it had in a long time if we take it appropriately and we're trying to bring people into the discussion, not as enemies, but as collaborators and as citizens. So I got to be an optimist. That's who I am. I'm going to keep rolling along best we can. We're taking cows to the mountains and I hope my granddaughter is as well. Well said, and thank you, sir, for your time. Thanks for the time. I enjoyed it. Be sure to tune in next month when our special guest will be Andy Hedges, a cowboy poet from West Texas, talking about the Western heritage through poetry and gearing up for the Cowpoke Fall Gathering in November in Loomis. Hit that subscribe button so you won't miss an episode of Tuned Into the Land. Thank you again for listening. This is Michael Delbar, the CEO of the California Rangeland Trust, and we'll talk to you next month.